bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Yeah. God loves us extensively and exclusively, and thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the great love that you have for our lives and all of the ways you work in our life and the, and the blessings and the provisions. We praise you and rejoice in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. All right, you guys remember where we are, I know, right? Because you remember every word that we did last week and every word that's come before. I've been in a, I've been in a series, and you know, it's kind of worked out, really, I think, to, um, to speak to some issues of our hearts and lives during these days where we're uh, trapped in and we're, uh, we're being pushed in on every side to be afraid and to fear and to... Uh, Ex exclude ourselves from everything, you know, and, and just uh, basically live a life without really any conscious thought of God involved in it whatsoever, as if somehow God did not uh, anticipate what might happen, and he doesn't have any provision for all of us. And it's just amazing to see how God answers things in his word even before you know that they're going to happen. And uh, we started a series, I started a series about uh, five or six weeks ago about, uh, about greatness, about being great. Not great in terms of what the world would call great, you know, to be rich or famous or popular, which are the common ways of greatness in the world's eyes, but to be great in the eyes of God. And to be great in the eyes of God, what that entails is you accomplishing, me accomplishing what God created us for. Because God has a purpose for our life and God created us for a purpose. And we have a purpose and God has a, a some people call it his will for our life. And if that's better for you, fine, then use that word. God has a will. God has a purpose. God has a direction. God has a, an accomplishment for you, an achievement for you that will manifest him to this world that we've all been called to be salt and light to. And so one of my favorite uh, characters in the Bible, and I, I, I'm sure it's one, most people's, one of most people's favorite character in the Bible is King David. And, and I've preached about him many times and, and many different messages and so forth, but uh, about six or seven weeks ago, I began to just kind of look at all of the different things that happened in David's life and the fact that God called him a man after his own heart. Now, that wasn't David's mama talking. That was God talking. God said, this man is after my own heart. Well, I knew that that didn't mean he was sinless because the Bible lists his sins. David had a great number of sins. David had great weaknesses in many areas. He was a tremendously great leader in some areas, but he had some notable weaknesses in his life also. And yet here's God saying, this man's after my own heart. And I began to read about him, you know, in 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st King. And I began to read some of the stories of his life and, 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 to, and to see if there was some correlation between what David actually was and the fact that God uh, said that he's a man after my own heart and then fulfilled the greatest prophecy that's ever been given by Jesus Christ, his son, being of the lineage of King David and sitting on the throne of King David. And, and we know that the Bible says that one day, the, the, the throne that, that he find, Jesus finally occupies will be the throne of his father, David. And it's an eternal throne, is what I'm saying to you. That's, a, that's quite an honor, quite a significance. So what was it that made David great? And I've been doing all along uh, 10 things that, that, that make you great. And uh, from the life of Israel's greatest king. And, and here, here they are, the first one, first two or three, can you? Every great man or woman becomes great on the battlefield. Uh, you don't become great by thinking about it or planning to do it or hoping one day. You, you actually become great on the battlefield where greatness is proven and greatness is developed. Secondly, every great person takes responsibility for his or her mistakes and becomes greater through them. Nobody's perfect, right? We're all gonna make mistakes. But a great person doesn't die in their mistakes. A great person admits their mistakes, doesn't try to blame somebody else, in other words. They take responsibility for themselves and the things they do. 
And then, and then they begin to, they grow from the mistakes they made. They learn lessons from the mistakes they made. And they ask God to take the mistake and to teach them and to, and to, and to give them grace to, to move past that. And so every great person grows from their mistakes because they're gonna make some, we all are gonna make mistakes. Uh, the third truth, every great person must rise above the pain of their past to reach their God-given destiny. Uh, we all have pain, right? We've all suffered things. Uh, that pain will stop you. That pain will debilitize, you, debilitate you. That pain will, 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 will cease your forward motion if you allow it to, if you get stuck in it, if you rehearse it, if you won't let it go, if you can't get past it, if you won't talk to anybody, you won't get any counsel. Uh, there are lots of reasons people stay in their pain. Many abuses in life are simply a response to to trying to, to deal with your pain in some way you think you can deal with it and you medicate yourself and you do all kinds of things in order to get past your pain. But great people get past the pain of their life and, and they move on and, and, and they don't let pain stop them in their tracks. The fourth truth is every great person is a worshiper of God and pays the price to be so. It's gonna cost you something to worship. Worship is a group activity for the most part in a church. So if you're gonna come, if you're gonna be a worshiper, you're gonna be a worshiper in your personal life and you're gonna be a worshiper in your church life. And whatever it takes and whatever it costs you to do that, you gotta get to church on time, you gotta be in the music, you gotta worship, you gotta put your hands up, you gotta respond to him in some way, you gotta face some criticism, you gotta swallow your pride. I mean, whatever it is, it's gonna cost you something to be a worshiper of God. But to be a great person, a great person is a worshiper of God and pays whatever price it takes to be that. And then this number five is the one we started last week and we'll finish up today hopefully, and that is every great person thinks in a positive, God-focused manner regardless of the circumstances. This just involves the, the, the way we approach life and the way we look at things. Now, of course, the story that I used last week, and I'm not gonna reread it because it takes about half of our time to read the story, but it, 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 the story's a very well-known story, probably, probably one of the most well-known stories in the scripture, and it's certainly one of the most inspirational stories in the scripture, and it's the story of where uh, shepherd boy David goes to the battlefield and fights giant Philistine Goliath of Gath and defeats him on the battlefield and wins a tremendous victory and uh, shows some tremendous courage and some tremendous thinking. And what, I've, what I wanna do and what I did last week, I wanna show you the four things that, that, uh, that make up great thinking, that make up God-focused type thinking, regardless of the circumstance. And the first one, just a reminder is that, that, that winners have faith-focused thinking. That just simply means that uh, when I think, it comes from Hebrews chapter 11 where, where, the, where Paul says, or, or the writer of Hebrews says, uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. In other words, God says, if you're gonna please me, the first thing it takes to please me is you're gonna to have to live by faith. You're going to come to me with faith because if you don't have faith, it is impossible for you to believe, uh, to, to, to uh, impress me or to live with me. Because to be a God-focused thinker, you first must believe that God is, which that just simply means God is what? God is here. God is now, God is present. Like the songs we sing, God loves us, God created us. All the promises of God and the word of God are given to us and they're all available to us, not just in the future and not just in the past, but God is alive right now. He is the living God. And that he loves us and moves us and motivates us. That, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What does that mean? That means that it's, it's reward oriented. It means that I understand that if I obey God, God promises to bless my life. 
and that if I will obey him, God is going to put his blessings into my life. And, and, and you say, well, you know, that kind of seems to be a little self-serving. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it this way, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Don't worry about where you're going to get your food or, or, or what you're going to sleep. or what. I mean, don't worry about any of that. If you seek me first, I'm going to give you all these things. So in other words, the Lord promises us that if we serve him, that there is a reward to those who serve him. Psalms 1, read it, verses 1 through 3, very famous. Blessed is the man who sitteth not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or, or walks in the way of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he does meditate day and night. That means he reads the Bible all the time. It means his thoughts are in the Bible all the time. And what does it end with? That he, he will prosper in all his ways. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a principle of God. Faith-focused thinking. David was a faith-focused thinker. Uh, if he wasn't, he would have never faced this giant because he had no military advantage and no physical advantage. All right, let's get to the second truth. The second truth is winners have fourth-dimensional thinking. Now, don't let this sound a little bit spooky because uh, we've all heard of the fourth dimension, right? Well, we live in a world of three dimensions, and the three dimensions are length, width, and height. And we live in a three-dimensional world, and we are three-dimensional characters. But we've all heard mentioned of the fourth dimension, and I'm just saying to you that David was someone who thought in another dimension other than the three typical human, uh, uh, human conditions here. And how do I know that? Well, when, when David looked at the giant, he obviously saw something different than the other soldiers did when they looked at the giant. When the other soldiers looked at the giant, I, I proposed what they saw were all of the advantages of the giant. Man, he's nine feet tall. Whoo, look at that big old sword he's got. I don't think we could get past that. And look at that spear. That spear looks like a fence post for the, for the handle of that spear. And that spearhead weighs 25 pounds. And he's got this little guy with a, with a shield in front of him. And, and, and he's got this giant bronze helmet and his giant bronze uh, armor all over himself. Man, he's too big. He's too, we can't do any. I mean, that's obviously what they saw when they looked at the giant. Because for 40 days, Goliath comes out and curses God and insults the guys of Israel for 40 days. And they stand there, and, and Goliath even looks at them and says, hey, why, don't you, why do you line up in a battle line? Uh, uh, am I not a Philistine and you a servants of Saul? Send a man down here and let him fight against me, and if he whips me, we'll serve you, and if you, I whip him, you'll serve us. Come on, you bunch of cowards. And so when, they, when the soldiers of Israel saw that, they said, whew, that guy, I mean, that, he, he, he's, he's got all the advantage. Well, when David saw Goliath, what did David think? Well, the only thing David said to let us know what he thought was, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, out of all the physical properties that Goliath had, David didn't look at him and say, whoo, what a giant. He didn't look at him and say, man, look at those weapons he has. He didn't look at him and say, I wonder where they got him from. I mean, my goodness, what a monster. We can't even get close enough to fight him. No, when David looked at him, the only physical thing David said is worth considering about that giant up there is he is uncircumcised. Now, what is this thing of, un I'm sure the other soldiers around him probably said, shh, 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 shh. you know, what a terrible time to bring up some medical condition. You know, I mean, shh, David, shh, shh. he's probably sensitive about it. You know, don't make him mad. I mean, <laughs> David, you know, what is this circumcision deal? Well, you know that Abraham uh, made a covenant with God. Abraham, the father of the Israelites, the father of God's people, the covenant that made them God's people was made with Abraham. And Abraham was promised to, uh, uh, his, his lineage would be like the sands of the sea, the stars of the sky, that all the earth would be blessed through him, that anybody that blessed him, God would bless, and anybody that cursed him, God would curse. And what was the sign that Israel gave God 
to show that they had joined the covenant. That was God's promises. What did Israel say they would do? They would circumcise every male child from that point forward. Simple task. Easy to see whether you comply or not. And the circumcision was the sign that Israel had received the covenant with God. Well, years before that date, something very similar to this happened. You remember back in Numbers chapter 10. I know you all read Numbers regularly. But in Numbers chapter 10, you remember Moses comes up to the promised land. And Moses says, you know, come here, guys. And he chose 12 spies. And he said, go in there and look at that land and come back and give us a report about, uh, about going into the land because that's, that's the land God promised us right there. Let's, and, and so the 12 spies went in. And what happened? Well, 10 of the spies came back with the report of, uh, whew, it's a good land, <laughs> no doubt about it, but <laughs> that land's occupied, man. <laughs> that land has giants in it. And then they gave a commentary of how, they, how it made them feel. And, they, and we look like grasshoppers in their sight. That's what they said. Why? Because that was their perspective. When they saw that land, that's what they saw. Giants and grasshoppers and my God, we can't do it. But there were two others that came back. Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb stilled the crowd and said, hey guys, I know there's some big guys in that land, but we can go in there and take them. They ain't nothing but some bread for us. Now all 12 spies saw the same thing, but their perspective was totally different. The 10 spies said, hey, I got some good news and I got some bad news for you. The good news is that land's everything God said it is. The bad news is it's occupied with giants. Joshua and Caleb come back out and say, I got some bad news for you and I got some good news for you. The bad news is, yep, they're giants in the land. The good news is they're not bigger than our God and God's going to give us uh, them for lunch, man. They are meat for us. Let's go in and get the land. And of course, they wander around for 40 years in the desert because they all believe the, minor, the majority report. And they come back. This is an interesting thing. They come back 40 years later. Same place. Joshua's leading them now. You know, Moses is dead and Joshua's leading them in. They come back to the same place and Joshua calls Caleb over. And he puts his arm on his shoulder and he says, Caleb, he said, you see that mountain right there? That is one of the choice pieces of property in this whole land and it's yours. Oh, there's only one problem. But the giants are still on that land. 85-year-old Caleb said, that's all right. Let's go get them. And he drove the three sons of Anak, giants, off of his land when he was 85 years old. I'm just saying that how do you look at things? Do you look with four-dimensional eyes? Do you see that, that, that fourth dimension, that, that realm of the spirit where, where God is and where the power of God is. See, Satan attempts in every possible way to keep us thinking three-dimensionally because if he can keep us thinking in three-dimensional terms, we are going to be overwhelmed. If the only thing you look at are the numbers in your checkbook, you're going to be overwhelmed. If the only thing you look at is how bad your marriage is and how close to divorce you are, you're going to be overwhelmed. If you look at how, what kind of difficulty you're having with your children and how terrible things seem to be in this young generation, you're going to be overwhelmed in life. If you look at your lack of success in business or sickness in your body or whatever it might be, if the devil can keep you looking three-dimensionally, you are going to be defeated and overwhelmed. What did James say in the Bible? You have not because you ask not. And what did Jesus say in John 16? Or excuse me, in John 14, he said that we could ask anything in his name. And he would do it. So why don't we ask? We don't ask 
because we are overwhelmed by what we see and we forget that God is with us. And I'm just saying that fourth dimension, a person, a successful person is a person that in the midst of their greatest opposition will push forward with the knowledge that the enemy is without cover. The enemy is not covered by God. David said, hey, he's uncircumcised. He has no covering from God. He has no covenant with God. He's a Philistine. He's unprotected. He's uncovered. I am circumcised. I am under the covenant. I am protected by God. What, what are we waiting on? Our enemy is, is child's play for us. And I will just say to you, look, we have defeated our enemy in greater ways than all of these ways that I've been preaching about. Man, we've defeated our enemy. Jesus Christ went to a cross and died on a cross and, and, and was buried and resurrected from the grave to do what? To defeat our enemy. We are afraid of a conquered foe who keeps us looking at his advantages rather than believing that God is there with us. And it all depends on how you look at things. Winners, winners see things in the fourth dimension. Let me give you another. Can you handle that? Is that? Okay. Fresh ideas are powerful ideas. I want you to listen to this now. Fresh ideas are powerful ideas. Do you know how the military fought in David's day? All the military. All of the military in David's day fought hand-to-hand -hand combat. Face-to-face, -face, sword, spear, you know, shield. That's how they fought. David had another idea. David had two strategies. Fresh idea. First of all, it was obvious that he wasn't going to be able to fight Goliath toe to toe. He's a boy. Goliath has a spearhead that's bigger than him. David will never even get close enough to, 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 try to try to jab him with the spear. Even if he could, he, he couldn't get close enough. David's little spear's about that long. Goliath's got a fence post for a handle in his. No, no, no. David, David said, man, we gotta, we gotta do something else like this. And so David comes with two different strategies. And here's the first one. The first strategy is, let's use a weapon that's never been used in battle before. Let's use a projectile. If I use a projectile, I can get close enough to hit him with it while staying far enough away from him that his sword or his spear won't hit me. And then his second strategy was, let's lull the enemy to sleep. Let's, let's encourage him to completely underwhelm himself to completely misjudge us. So what did David do? He went in to see he went in to see Saul the king. Saul said, "Put this armor on, man. Man, 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 man. helmet." Boom, boom. You know, I'm seeing David with the helmet half cocked. I mean, he's doing and the, and, the, and, the, and the armor just draping off of him, and the sword hooked to the armor just dragging the ground. You know, I'm, I'm seeing. I said, David says, "What did David do?" David said, "Take you know, and he, uh, took this off." He says, "He says, he says, sir." This, this stuff, well, I can't use it. I, I've never tried it. It's not, it's not for me. And Saul said, okay then, son. Um, go ahead and fight, but, but God better be with you. you know? And so what David do? David got his little shepherd uniform on, took his staff in his hand, which his staff was a stick. That's all it was. It's a stick. So he got his little shepherd uniform and his stick, and he's going down, and he's going down, and Goliath says, Come down here and I'll feed your, uh, feed you, your carcass to the buzzard, son. And David says, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the living God. And David starts running at him. Starts running down the path. Well, Goliath's not afraid. Why? 
Because number one, nobody can beat him in toe-to-toe combat. And number two, this is a boy with a stick coming at me. I mean, it's like, you know what? By the stuff Goliath says in that passage, Goliath got so insulted by that. He was so disrespected by that that it just blew his mind. Man, it threw him out in the twilight zone. He said, a boy is, what am I, a dog that you would come and send a boy with a stick down here? I'm going to kill all of you. I'm gonna, and I, he just gets beside himself. He loses all focus on the fact that that boy running down that path is coming down there to kill him. And he's all distracted. He's lulled to sleep. He has no fear of that boy with that stick over there. He doesn't see a sling. <laughs> and the next thing you know, the only thing Goliath hears is, <laughs> he's gone. He's gone. He never knew what hit him. David runs down there and takes Goliath's sword and cuts Goliath's head off with it. I'm just saying to you that before Goliath realized what happened, David, with a fresh idea, defeated a giant Philistine because of a better plan, a new idea something that didn't exist before. You've, seen, you've heard the old refrigerator saying, uh, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know what that means, right? It means that many of us try to do a lot of different things with the same tool. That's what that means. It means we don't look for a better tool. We just try to make our old tool work. Well, what if you're not hitting a nail? What if you're hitting a screw? Well, you need a screwdriver, right? You don't need a hammer. You need a screwdriver. And what if you need to cut this piece of wood? Well, you don't hit it with a hammer. You get a saw and cut it. You got a different tool for a different battle. Not using the same tool, no matter what the battle is being so stubborn and arrogant and hard-headed and hard-minded and traditional-minded that you're going to do what you do how you've always done it if it hair lips hell. And see, here's the thing. Most, most people think that what David did was not new, really. They think what David did was something he had done before because they interpret David to have used this sling before. But that's not what the Bible says. You, when David came to Saul and Saul said, you can't do this, you're a boy and he's a man. And then David starts, David says, uh, respectfully, respectfully, because he's talking to the king now. You, you don't just run in there and blast and be disrespectful. You, it, that's the authority of your nation, buddy. He says, he says uh, uh, sir, uh, you're, uh, I'm, I'm your servant. And when, and, and, and when your servant was keeping his sheep, his father's sheep, there was a lion that came out of the woods and grabbed one of my sheep and took off running. And I chased him down. He didn't say I took my sling and knocked him off his feet. He said, I chased him down and hit him, knocked him down, grabbed his beard with my bare hands and pulled him apart and took my lamb out and walked back to the flock. And I did the same thing to the bear, he said. And this uncircumcised Philistine is not going to be anything. God bless me. Saul said, okay, son, you can do it. But see, David didn't say he used the sling. I propose to you that he had never used the sling. And this was the first time ever that a sling was used in a battle as a projectile weapon. It was a brand new weapon for a brand new fight. And listen, I want you to please remember this. If you don't remember anything else out of this message, please remember what I'm about to say. I want to give you a truth that you need to know and you need to remember this. In John 16, when Jesus was going back to heaven, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you 
And here's what he said. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And then this is the dynamic part. And he will lead you into all truth. All, not just spiritual truth, not just our Sunday school lesson and our Bible verses. The Holy Spirit will give you whatever truth you need. If it's about business, the Holy Spirit knows all about business. If it's about church, he knows all about church. If it's about medicine, man, he knows all about medicine. I got a new job and I got to work on a computer. Well, the Holy Ghost knows computers, man. Ask him. Say, Lord, I got to have some help. I don't know what I'm doing in this thing, but you do, God, give me some new wisdom for this. He is the spirit of truth and he will lead you into A-L-L truth. So whatever you need, according to what Jesus said, ask God. If you need a screwdriver, ask him for a screwdriver. If you need a saw, if you don't even know what you need, say, God, what do I need? And then give it to me, would you? Because I'm just confused as I can be here. I don't even know what's going on. And when you pray, pray specifically. Say, Holy Spirit, how do I deal with this child? I, look, I know how I dealt with the other ones, and it worked good for the other ones, but it ain't working for this one. So God, how can I deal with this child? Give me a strategy for this child. Or this job. Or God, how do I reach lost people nowadays? We used to go door to door and hand out tracts and talk to them and then talk to us now. Nobody will even open the door. How do we win the world this day that we're living in? God, how do I get my business back up? It's flattering or flittering. I'm going bankrupt. What do I need to do? And God says the Holy Spirit will lead you. And, and the, the starting point of this is humility. I just want to say this. You're not going to do any of this if you don't have humility. You know why those other soldiers didn't do the same thing David did? I guarantee you there was not one soldier in Israel's army that day that would have done what David did. You know why? Because they were standing up there by all their buddies that had armor on. And they were soldiers and they had the spear and the helmet. And, 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 and the, second, the second they started taking their armor off... And they said, hey, bud, what's going on? He said, I'm going down there to fight that jet. <laughs> I mean, they would have been laughed out of the army. All of their little reprobate buddies would have laughed them to scorn because they dare to think they could go down there without that armor on it. I mean, they had pride in who they were and what they were, and they didn't want people laughing at them. I am shocked to find out how many people would rather look good and lose because they're married to tradition and they don't want the ridicule of somebody mocking them when they make a change in life. They're failures because God tells them what to do and they don't have enough courage to do it because they don't want people making fun of them. You've got to be humble. You, uh, David, the first thing David said to King Saul when he found out that that wasn't going to work is he said, uh, hey, hey, he just laid it off and said, hey, that ain't going to work for me. That ain't going to work for me. And then when he went out in his little shepherd boy costume, uh, I don't know what the soldiers did. They probably laughed at him. What's that little punk doing? You know? But it didn't matter because in a few seconds later, Goliath was laying down there with the head chopped off. And they were shouting the victory as if they had won it. <laughs> Fresh ideas or powerful ideas. You got time for one more? I know I'm preaching way too long. Here's the last one. Winners think in forceful terms. If you are a weak thinker and you are going to give up the first time somebody criticizes what you say God told you to do, I'm just saying, look, if God tells you to do it, you do it. And don't let anybody dissuade you from doing it. I don't care if it doesn't make sense. Because I'm going to tell you what, the Holy Spirit is never going to lead you in something that is unscriptural and unrighteous and unsuccessful. 
God will always, everything he tells you to do will line up with his word and it'll line up with his, with his nature and it will be successful if you will do it like God says do it. But you can't be a weak thinker. You gotta be a forceful thinker or else the world's gonna turn you away from God's idea immediately because I got news for you. There are always, there is always going to be resistance. Now, we don't even call it resistance now. We, we, we have a new word for it. We call it pushback. We're going to get some pushback. What does it mean? Some people are going to resist you. That's what pushback means. Pushback. Well, David got some pushback. Do, do you know he didn't even barely get to the battlefield until he got pushback? His oldest brother, Eliab, one of the soldiers, by the way, his three oldest brothers were soldiers in the army. All three of them. There were three of them. There's eight sons all together. He was the baby boy. His daddy sent him up there with the cheese and nabs and stuff. Said, take these to the boys and find out what's going on on the battlefield. David takes it up there. He gives the food to the little uh, 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 vendor there, battlefield vendor. And then he goes over there and he hears Goliath talking, cursing God, mocking him. And then... One of the soldiers said, hey, have you heard what's going to be done for the man who kills this, this big giant? He's going to be loaded down with gold. He's going to get to marry the king's daughter and his whole family, nobody in his family, brother, sister, mom, and dad, him, will ever pay taxes again in Israel. Rest of their lives. And then David, I'm sure shocked at the, at the, at, at the paralyzed soldiers over here, and this tremendous <laughs> reward over here, he was so shocked he had to say, would you say that again? I can't believe nobody's jumping on that. I must have missed something here. And his older brother Eliab heard what he said. And when he did, he came unglued. He started yelling at Dave. This is his oldest brother. Now you know his daddy doesn't think anything about him. Because his daddy didn't even remember him when Samuel came to anoint everybody. Samuel had to ask the question, aren't there any more boys? And, da and Jesse goes, uh, 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 oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. But that little runt, my little baby boy, he's out there. But that couldn't be him. He's, he, he's so totally unimpressive, I didn't even bring him in. So you know his daddy doesn't have anything for him. Now his older brother, who would be the next one in line to try to give him a little esteem, his older brother looks at him and says, what are you doing up here, punk? And who, where'd you, who'd you leave those little tiny mangy sheep with? You got go, to gotta keep safe down there. I know, your, I know your arrogant heart. I know why you're up here. You're up, you don't care anything about us. You're just up here because you want to see somebody die. That's what his oldest brother said to him. You know what, you know what David did? David turned around and said, Eliab, isn't there a cause? Eliab, isn't there, it, this is important, man. It, it, isn't there a cause? And then King Saul looked at him and said, you're too little. You can't fight. He was a soldier. You, you've never been a soldier. You, you can't do it, boy. And David, very politely, now he did, now look, David did not blow out at anybody in this situation. This is a very important thing because I'm going to talk to you about obeying authority in one of these future dates. But David did not come angrily against his authority in any of these situations. He did not get out of line one step. He looked at King Saul and he said, Saul, I'm your servant. So I'm going to do whatever you say to me. So see, he's making a righteous appeal. That's what he's doing. If, if, if you're approaching an authority, your boss, your parents, your your, your, your teachers or whoever it might be that's an authority over you and you're approaching them and they've given you an order to do something that you really think there's a better way or you may disagree with it totally. Let me just, let me just tell you now, do not, do not blow out at that authority. God gives authority. And you if, you, if you don't think it's right, make a righteous appeal. Make an appeal with some reason to it, unemotional, and leave it with them. And if they still say no, then go to God and say, Lord, 
if we need, this needs to be changed, change his mind. Or you change his mind. And then you obey the authority. I mean, obviously, unless it's illegal or immoral. But that's what David did. He said, I'm your servant. And I thought, the bad, and God protected me, and I can do it here. And king said, okay, okay, go fight him. King gave him permission. Because he made a righteous appeal. And then Goliath, when Goliath saw him coming, Goliath said, what is this? These people are sending a boy with a stick, man. And David just looked at him, and, David, and he cursed at David. He cursed at David. David didn't curse back at him. David just said, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I'm coming against you in the name of the living God. All he did is just pronounce God's heart on this guy and stayed submitted and didn't blow up and he never gave the wrong response. And God blessed his life. God was with him. God conquered through him. David was a forceful thinker. You got time for one other little thought? Okay. How about you guys? All right. Here's the thought. Have you ever read about David's mighty men? His mighty men. Read 2 Samuel chapter 23 when you get home. 2 Samuel 23. It's all about David's mighty men. There are 37 of them in all. These guys are superheroes. These guys are like Adino the Esnite. I know it sounds funny, his name. But there's one thing you didn't want to hear if you were an enemy. Odino, Adino doesn't like you. If you heard that, it terrified you because Adino killed 800 soldiers in one single battle. Then Abishai was another. Abishai killed 300 men with only his spear in a single battle. And then Benaiah. Benaiah became uh, Solomon's general like Joab was for David. Benaiah, now this is a funny thing. He killed, and I'm, and I'm going to read what it says he did. So I'm just, He killed two lion-like heroes of Moab at one time. So I'm thinking if they're lion-like heroes, they're big men, strong, powerful. They're like a lion, built like a lion. Mean. Uh, he, he took on two of them at a time, and he didn't even have a weapon. He took their spear away from them and killed both of them with it. And, this is a funny little phrase, and he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. That's what the Bible says. It's like he's walking down the road and it's snowing and there's a lion down in a pit and he says, I think I'll jump down there and kill him. And he did it. And then, and, 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 and on and on the list goes. And they just did these things. Now, the question would be, not where did these men get their superpowers from? The question wouldn't be, where did David find these to make up such a group of mighty men? You know what the question should be? Where were these guys when Goliath was sitting up there insulting Israel for 40 days? These guys were champions, man. They would have made mincemeat of Goliath. Matter of fact, Jonathan, David's nephew, named after his best friend, Saul's son, Jonathan, killed a giant with six fingers on each hand and six toes. Goliath would have been missing. Where were they? I'm telling you what, what happened. What happened is when David became get, king of Israel, men began thinking in a different way. And when they began thinking in a different way, they began to do mighty things for God. I'm just saying to you, you start thinking right. What's it going to do to your family? What's going to happen to them? David becomes king of Israel. David begins thinking this way. Israel just escalates, wins battles, wins conquer territory. Mighty nation. David quits being king. Whoop. Now she goes again. What? Only difference? What? The way he thinks. He's not a big master giant. He, Nothing, nothing significant about him except the way he thinks. All right, let me, let me, I've done it gone way out. How long have I preached? Four hours? All right. All right.